Your cream cheese frosting is runny for either or both of these reasons. Number one, the recipe is using cream cheese like it would butter. Even though it's solid, this contains up to 55% water, whereas butter usually contains around 18% water. Cream cheese, you kind of have to think of it as heavy cream because these two are more similar in fat and water content. Number two, that smooth spreadability that makes cream cheese great for the top of your bagel actually makes it horrible to use in frostings. It has this really unique characteristic in that when you mix it or agitate it for a really long time, Time, or it comes in direct contact with sugar, which draws out moisture, liquefies the cream cheese. And unfortunately, that's how most cream cheese frostings are made. You're going to mix the cream cheese and butter together and then add in your powdered sugar. Hi, I'm Adriana from Sugarology, where we get into the science of baking. So I'm gonna address both of those problems with my frosting. It's called butter cream cheese frosting number 22 because it took me 22 experiments to get right. It pipes beautifully on top of cupcakes, but I really wanted to push this frosting to its limits. So I'm going to fill and frost a four layer cake and see if it holds up. And you can probably see in the thumbnail that it did work, although it does have its quirks. Cream cheese frosting is not an easy ingredient to work with, but I think I figured a few things out and I'm gonna share everything with you. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is cut up some cold butter from the fridge into large chunks. This needs to be cold for when it's added at the end, so back into the fridge it goes. Next, in a small bowl, I'm going to add some non-fat dried milk powder and a little bit of water to rehydrate. Non-fat milk powder contains all the dried milk solids, which are mostly proteins that help the frosting both in flavor and coming together. And mixing it in this way just makes sure that when it's added to the frosting, there's no lumps. So go ahead and set that aside for now. And here's the bowl of my stand mixer and I'm going to add full fat cream cheese and some white granulated sugar. But first, let me back up a little and talk about the cream cheese. I have to be brand specific, but only for the reason that companies make their cream cheeses differently. And here are the kinds that I've tried. Great Value from Walmart, Target's Good and Gather, and Lucerne. These all worked the best. Trader Joe's worked great. It was a little more yellow in the end than I would have liked. And I'm still experimenting with Philadelphia and will update my recipe page with any new findings. I have a feeling that these all act differently because of the type of stabilizers they use in the cream cheese. And you may be wondering why this matters, but stabilizers are what makes our cream cheeses solid and spreadable. They work by binding to water, which remember cream cheese has a lot of, and they add bulk, so to speak, to a liquid. So here, imagine this plastic bag is full of heavy cream where the balls represent fat or fat globules, kind of sloshes around in there. I'm gonna add some stabilizers to my pretend heavy cream, which is represented by these gift bag fillers. What happens is now the formerly liquid cream turns solid because we have these starches sitting in the water taking up space. And they do this without adding a weird taste or texture, at least in cream cheese. But don't let the fact that cream cheese is solid here fool you. Like I said in the very beginning of this video, the problem with cream cheese frosting arises because we try to treat the cream cheese like butter. So instead, we're gonna use the cream cheese for flavor and its water content to dissolve our sugar. So into the bowl goes that cream cheese and sugar, and I'm gonna let this run with the whisk attachment on my stand mixer for at least two minutes. We're gonna completely break down the stability of the cream cheese, at least temporarily, which is actually problem number two, but we're gonna turn it around and use those shortcomings to our advantage. See, there are three things that destroy the stability of cream cheese. Sugar, agitation, which we've just done, and one more thing, heat. So onto the top of a double boiler it goes. And once I see a good amount of fog rising from the boiling pot, I'll go ahead and place my bowl on top and use a spatula to stir the mixture. Throughout this process, it's a good idea to pay attention to the color of the mixture. It's gonna go from like a white to a yellow color and the viscosity or thickness where it goes from thick to running off the spatula very easily. And there's two options to know when you're done. You can either cook this until it goes to 175, which is the most reliable method. It's what I use. Or you can wait until the sugar granules dissolve by feeling a little bit of the cream cheese, your fingers, and then starting a timer based on the amount that you're cooking. You can't really boil this mixture, which really helps because we don't want to burn the milk proteins in the heavy cream. I did try this with a direct heat using a pan. It was far more difficult to manage the heat, which is why the double boiler works really well. The heating is not only melting the fat, but I believe it's also loosening up the stabilizers that we talked about earlier. So the cream cheese is gonna definitely get runnier. And I think that the sugar is also yanking out the water, dissolving within it. Okay, 
And once you reach your temperature or the timer goes off, you'll know that you're ready to move on when you take a bit and feel it with your fingers. Use a spatula and just be careful because the mixture is hot. It's not hot enough to burn you, but it will be hot. It's going to feel very slick, like a Vaseline based moisturizer with no sugar granules and no lumps from the cream cheese. Now remove the bowl, which be careful also may be hot. Grab that reserved milk powder paste and do one last stir to get out any chunks in there and pour that in along with dried egg whites. Both of these ingredients are going to give our cream cheese a little bit more structure using the water contained inside that cream cheese. So notice how I'm adding these ingredients in while the mixture is still hot because the water is still relatively accessible, which I think is happening because the mixture is still very loose and not thick. I'm gonna use my spatula to stir the powders in and then with my whisk attachment, let this go on high speed for five minutes, scraping down once in the middle to make sure everything's all mixed in. At the end of this step, this is what your cream cheese looks like. It has the thick consistency of kind of like an Elmer's glue, but it's more yellow in color. Now, while the mixture is still warm, go grab your plate of cold butter from the fridge and see how hard it is for me to squeeze. It's still really cold. And we're gonna add that in while the whisk is going on medium to low speed, one chunk at a time. And once all the butter has been added in, it's gonna look chunky and yellow and that's fine. You're gonna crank the mixer up to high speed with the whisk attachment still on and let that go, stopping just when it comes together. So just for reference, this is a KitchenAid artisan making six cups of buttercream for a six inch cake. And it took around three to four minutes. So how do you know when it's come together? Well, this is the emulsification step. So the milk proteins from the butter and probably the milk powder are going to connect the fat and water-based ingredients together. And when you do that, you're going to notice your buttercream get lighter in color and much fluffier. Here's the texture of the buttercream at the step. So you can see it's almost like a whipped butter. And because of the cream cheese, it's going to have an off-white to cream color. If you're having trouble getting to this point, it's most likely because you need to chill this mixture or keep mixing because it hasn't yet emulsified. Before a mixture emulsifies, it often looks really liquid, which is a little bit confusing, but then when it gets cold or if you keep mixing, it'll often come together. You can place this bowl in the fridge for about 10 minutes and bring it back out, whip it, and see if it comes together. Now, because we were using the whisk attachment, this frosting is full of large air pockets and going to be hard to frost with. So I'm gonna add my paddle attachment. I'm also gonna add some flavor. So about a teaspoon of fresh lemon juice, you can also also add a little bit of vanilla, but I think that takes away from the cream cheese flavor. Lemon juice is actually the opposite. The acidity of lemon juice actually increases the tanginess of cream cheese without adding a lemon flavor. So I usually let this run for about a minute until it's nice and smooth. Now I have my frosting, I have my red velvet cake layers, and I'm going to go ahead and fill and crumb coat my cake and test the stability of this frosting. But first we have to define stability just for a second here. Cream cheese frosting fits into a different category of frostings. We have to group it with whipped cream or frostings that we have to refrigerate. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration recommends refrigerating foods with cream cheese within two hours. It helps that I cook my cream cheese in this recipe, but I still max out the time at room temperature with this frosting at about four hours. So really, we have to make sure that the frosting is stable for up to four hours because when we refrigerate it, the lower temperature solidifies a fat in the butter and cream cheese, making the frosting extremely firm. Now, this is obviously an extreme example example since I'm doing such a tall cake, but you want to make sure that your frosting doesn't get too soft while you're working with it. By the time I did my third layer, you can kind of see that that first filling was starting to bulge a little. So I went ahead and placed the cake in the fridge to set for about 20 minutes. Once it was nice and firm, it was much easier to work with and I was able to crumb coat it fully. Now working with the frosting while soft became much more of a problem when I did the top coat. At this point, the frosting had been sitting out for about an hour and I had mixed it again with my paddle attachment to smooth it out briefly before attempting the top coat. I could definitely finish the cake, but it was like working with whipped cream instead of buttercream. So I scraped off all that frosting, placed it back into the bowl, and then into the fridge for 15 minutes to firm up and smooth it out again with the paddle attachment for just a minute. So look how much easier it is to work with. It's just something to keep in mind when using this frosting for a layer cake. It seems as if the working temperature for this frosting for a good kind of smoothing texture is actually a tiny bit chilled. But the thing is, once you get it on the cake, it almost sets. And I think it has to do with the stabilizer relaxing from all that agitation and mixing and spreading and chilling, of course, helps too. 